I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'd like to uh, say a word about uh, certain kinds of meditation and then also speak to a comment question that came in at uh, 45 minutes past the hour um, <clears throat> from Liz. Uh, first, in meditation, there are certain practices that in which we become increasingly absorbed in something. They're often described as concentration practices. You might have heard the word shamatha or samadhi practices in which we become increasingly absorbed in some object of awareness. Could be the sensations of breathing at the upper lip, could be a feeling of loving kindness, it could be a sense of rest. And then as we become increasingly absorbed in that, we absorb it into ourselves. And so you have the two senses of the word concentration in that we are both concentrating on something and it is becoming concentrated like a delicious sauce inside us. Uh, there are pitfalls and challenges in any form of meditation. Uh, concentration practices, you know, have the potential pitfalls of over-efforting, uh, getting really, really intense about it and goal-directed and irritated if your mind wanders, things like that. Um, you know, there are pit pitfalls in just in simply being present and just sitting, just mindfully, you know. Uh, it can be hard to sustain that sense of uh, just open presence. There's a place for both of these. And it's a useful thing to appreciate that you can choose just about any object of meditation, including something you want to develop more inside, such as a growing sense of tranquility or a kind of an open, calm, and loving heart. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's important to realize we don't have to be just stuck on only one kind of meditation. It's, it's possible to become increasingly concentrated in something as seemingly ineffable as tranquility. We can become intensely tranquil, which sounds like an oxymoron, except it's the tranquility is all pervading, the sense of rest is all pervading. And one of the things that really supports uh, the absorption in what's wholesome and beneficial is the sense of enjoyment. Um, that has neurological benefits as well in terms of intensifying the cultivation of whatever it is we are enjoying. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, the second thing is with regard to Liz's comment, concerned about dissociation and confusion uh, as we let go of negative parts of ourselves and create a new version of ourselves. I could apply that as well to my conversation with Jed. Um, early, you know, before the official start at the top of the hour uh, about you know, disidentifying from and becoming disenchanted with the, the apparent um, self. Uh, as we do these practices, indeed, it can become discombobulating. And so there's a certain amount of discombobulation that's beneficial, but if it's too much, it gets scary and we get lost. So it's important to have things that are refuges for us. The sense in the body, um, sense of reassurance, being present, feet on the ground, comfortable chair, we know where we are. <laughs> Ram Dass <laughs> tells a story in Be Here Now, bless his memory, in which he was, he had come back from India, done deep practices there, all laid on top of a tremendous amount of experience with psychedelics. He was doing apparently some kind of talk radio out of New York City in 1973, or you can imagine, and or even earlier. And people would call him on the talk radio to talk to Ramdas, wildly tripping in the middle of complete insanity. Just everything's crazy. And uh, you're like, ah. And he, and he might say to them something like, hey, I want to talk to the person who dialed this 10-digit phone number, that part of the person that was indeed grounded and centered. So it's important to, to stay in touch with those parts. Um, 
not in some kind of rigid, fearful way, but staying connected to our refuges so that we can tolerate a growing discombobulation, a growing deconstruction, disentangling of the conventional knottedness of the elements of the psyche as we start to open out into the full fabric and even, whoa, start noticing the space between the threads. Whoa! It really helps to have have simple things like the feeling of your cat in your lap, you know, as you go on that journey. Okay. So, as I mentioned, I'm exploring what could be called wise effort. I'm going to try to bring some freshness to that exploration. Uh, And last week, I spoke about Uh, a very important aspect of wise effort, perhaps the foundation of it, which is to establish, much as I was saying a moment ago, the sense of being already home. Already at home in your body, already at home in the resting state, the green zone of our biology, when it feels like needs are met enough in the moment, already home. Today, I would like to talk about practice. Practice. In other words, it's kind of um, a central aspect of wise effort, of course. Life happens to us, and we happen in life, in nature, in reality. It's all happening. Then what? I've had the experience many times as a therapist and a teacher where someone will talk with me and about some really challenging situation, and it's it's really appropriate for me to simply listen and, and to be with them. And at a certain point, uh, either they are asking or I am asking, okay, wow, <coughs> yuck, yikes. How, how might you practice with that? So what does that mean? In other words, we can either be swept along by, by what is occurring in life and what is occurring in our experiences of life. We can either be swept along in ignorance, fueled and poisoned by the classics, hatred, greed, I would add heartache, right? Or we can practice in our relationship to what is occurring and in our relationship to what we're experiencing and in how we respond to it, how we respond to and um, practice in our relationship with what is happening to us, our experiences of that, and the nature of reality itself. That's the field of practice, how we relate to it and how we respond to it. I think that practice is like a three-legged stool, has these three fundamental elements. And I'll use the poly terms for what I have in mind initially, metta, sati, and bhavana. Some helpful folks who know how to spell these words uh, might want to put them in the chat. Metta, sati, bhavana. I am loosely translating these as loving, knowing, and growing. I'm using those terms partly because there's a nice little rhyme at the end, and also because I want to start with the heart. Because Starting at the heart is the foundation of mindfulness, knowing, and cultivation or growing. It's the foundation. Because if you don't have heart for yourself and for others, what's the point? What's the point of mindfulness? What's the point of the development of beneficial qualities inside while healing and releasing along the way? The heart. I also like starting with the heart because I think it's kind of a corrective to what can be, um, you know, and I think an overly analytical and dry and top down and uh, dare I say patriarchal kind of approach, you know, that has sort of run through Buddhism for 2,500 years. Uh, I like starting with the heart. I think it's really important. So let's start there. And this is an overview, a survey of these three aspects of practice. Hopefully there will be useful things in this survey, and um, it could be that it's helpful for you to um, to consider what you could develop more of, what you could focus more on. 
And along the way, I'll be putting a lot of really good quotations into the chip. Here's the first one. And by the way, uh, sati is spelled typically S-A-T-I. The, there's different sometimes the spelling of the Pali and the Sanskrit, uh, but you'll get it. Okay, here we go. So, whoops. Hmm, hang on. There we go. This is the classic uh, Metta Sutta. You're probably familiar with it. It really kind of sets an overall aspiration. So much of practice is aspirational. We start with what's there, and then you know we're, we, we stretch toward, we reach toward how we will relate to it and how we will respond to it. So here we have classically, may all beings be happy and secure, May all beings be happy at heart. Omitting none, whether they are weak or strong, seen or unseen, near or distant, born or to be born, may all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise anyone anywhere or through anger or ill will wish for another to suffer. Just as a mother would protect her child, her only child, with her own life, even so, you should cultivate a boundless heart toward all beings. You should cultivate kindness toward the whole world with a boundless heart, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without enmity or hate. Whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, as long as you are alert, you should be resolved upon this mindfulness. This is called a sublime abiding here and now. It's so lovely to hear these words echo to us down, you know, 25 centuries. And I just want to point out that in the sutta is a key point, which is that loving, knowing, and growing are entwined with each other. And you can find all three often, as you hear, see here, with the word repeatedly of cultivation. We are developing this trait inside us of loving kindness and compassion. And also, you can see here the importance of mindfulness. We can't really sustain cultivation if we're not mindful. We can't sustain mindfulness if we don't cultivate factors of mindfulness. And all of that is in service of the heart. So, someone says every couple of minutes, my speech is cutting out. Sorry. It's there might be a wobble with the internet at my end. I don't know, maybe other people are getting a clean transmission here. Uh, I see thumbs up from some people. So it might be something specific, you know, in different places. Uh, I'm using the word practice, Elena, or Elaine rather, as an overarching term, inside of which I'm emphasizing three aspects. I'm calling loving, knowing, and growing as my kind of way of talking about um, loving kindness, mindfulness, and cultivation. Okay? So I have a couple other quotes for you here uh, that I think are very relevant these days. <clears throat> I'll do these two. Hmm. Bear with me. My computer is causing me trouble. Hopefully Zoom will let me put this full quotation, there are three here, into the chat. Yes, lovely. Okay, so you know there's kind of a joke uh, in the monastery or wherever, think you're so enlightened, go home for the holidays, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think about what's coming up for many people, I think about this politically contentious time, uh, certainly intensified in many quarters by events around the world in terms of various wars, including in the Middle East. And, you know, there's a lot of practical wisdom around how do we actually bring into, into practice, into reality, uh, down to earth, the aspirations and the unboundedness of the inspiring intentions in the Metta Sutta. Well, you know, here's a very, very direct quotation from the Dhammapada, there are, there are those who do not realize that one day we all must die. But those who do realize this 
settle their quarrels. Now, by settle their quarrel does not mean letting others walk all over you. There was nothing in the Metta Sutta that was about giving up your own rights, uh, the unbounded nature of compassion and kindness must include oneself. Uh, you know, there is a, <laughs> there are, are passages in the uh, original teachings of the Buddha in which uh, he uses words like fool. Uh, and so there's a recognition and discernment of um, certain kinds of people. They're not condemned, but one steps back from them, right? Uh, there's some kind of line that associating, trying to find wisdom while associating with a fool is like asking the spoon to taste the soup or something like that. Anyway, so just because we're practicing loving kindness and just because we're settling our quarrels does not mean at all that we need to be a doormat. And I've written a lot most of it freely offered about um, kindness and assertiveness together and their intersection, uh, including in my book, um, Making Great Relationships. Okay, In all this is a insight into interconnectedness. Right? The second quote, as I am, so are others, as others are, so am I. Having thus identified self and others, harm no one, nor have them harmed. And I appreciate that this is aspirational. And I love this quotation from Larry Yang, which is in my book, Neurodharma. I, I can't put it in here, but basically he says, uh, may I love everyone. And if I can't love everyone, may I love someone. And if I can't you know, love someone, may I have compassion. And if I can't have compassion, may I do no harm. And if I must do harm, may I do as little harm as possible. Larry said it vastly better than I did. And you might be able to find that quotation somewhere. So there's a degree to this, right? There's a degree to us, but at least harm less. At least harm less, you know? Uh, and then of course, knowing that the other person is angry, one who remains mindful and calm acts for one's own best interest and for the other's interest too. Uh, at this holiday season in my own extended relationship networks, there are people who have definitely really mistreated me. Um, in some cases, I had my own part in that whole process, that whole mess, uh, even if, in my view, my part did not warrant the fullness of the mistreatment that came my way. And yet, what are we gonna do about it? Do we wanna keep holding that hot stone of rancor and resentment? Or do we find ways to let it go with clear seeing and a releasing along the way? And in that, you know, we step out of the quarrel. We step out of the, we get out of the war in our head. Um, we stop fueling the fires. We step out of contentiousness. We, you know, we draw lines as we need to. We speak the truth, you know, as we know it. But we're out of the war. We wish them well. We may wish them well while uh, never wanting to speak to them again. We may wish them well while being quite content with sending them a little email on their birthday once a year, not expecting a response. Uh, but in our heart, we're not quarreling with them anymore. Okay. And then, Last quotation from my friend Henry Shuckman, who occasionally guest teaches. It's always a gem. Think of this as perhaps one of the deepest ways of reflecting on loving. Henry's upcoming book, uh, for which I wrote the foreword, uh, is it's called Original Love, really highly recommended. He says, I think this was a, he said this to me and I wrote it down very quickly. Original love is the ocean. It's been there all along. Finally, there is no difference anymore between us and it. 
And that is a great, great blessing. Yeah, wow. Malaya, wow. So, you know, the, each one of these practices can be extended from just the beginning, just a touch, whoosh, all the way up, including this practice of love. I will admit that of these three, even though I'm probably best known for my work on neuro bhavana, you know, <laughs> taking in the good, deliberate cultivation of, pardon me, the deliberate internalization of beneficial experiences, I have to say that um, I think love of the three is the most transformative and foundational. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that um, being lived by love, given over to love, uh, resting in original love, uh, finding the, living in the givenness of the um, arising moment, resting in nature, just the original love in nature, our ancestors, the, the plants, the animals giving us our life. Wow, thank you. Uh, in a very deep way, Henry is a Zen master, a Zen teacher with a lot of realization, is speaking to our, our original nature. He's playing with the phrase from Zen, typically original mind, show me your face before you were born, you know, original mind. And he's saying original mind is, is love in, the, in, in, a very, in, 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 a, in many different kinds of ways. So I wanna keep going now, and I wanna talk with you about knowing. So we have the common sense of, know, of mindfulness. Uh, great work, John Kabat-Zinn and many other teachers. Uh, I think of mindfulness uh, as sustained present moment awareness, pure and simple. We can add to that, but it's sustained present moment awareness of both the inner and the outer world. Um, in that sustained present moment awareness is a quality of recollectedness roots of the word uh, for uh, mindfulness in sati and in Sanskrit are memory, being recollected. I think of it as a little bit as collected, gathered together rather than fragmented and scatterbrained, you know, scattered apart. So that's pretty foundational sense of mindfulness, pretty basic, okay. And then we can start exploring perhaps some deepening some deeper aspects of it. And I'm gonna put some really, for me, useful quotations in the chat. Whoops, here. Great. This comes from Ajahn Chah. So in mindfulness, um, about this mind, in truth, there is nothing really wrong with it. It is intrinsically pure. Um, interesting. Within itself, it's already peaceful. He's speaking here about mind in the deepest sense, pretty close to awareness. That the mind is not peaceful these days is because it follows moods. The real mind doesn't have anything to it. It is simply an aspect of nature. It simply is nature occurring locally. It becomes peaceful or agitated because moods deceive it. So this is one way of relating to this, that in our mindfulness, we could be mindful as awareness, as mind broadly. I write about this a lot in the wholeness, being wholeness section of neurodharma. You know, mind itself is undisturbed. Disturbance pass through, but mind as a whole is always simply mind as a whole. If we want to take consciousness with awareness and its contents, consciousness defined as awareness and its contents, the whole, it's always the whole. If we take consciousness simply as awareness, awareness itself is undisturbed as disturbances pass through it. Wow. And as we deepen in our mindfulness, we become full of 
find in that deep way. Then I want to quote here from Tara Brock. She wrote me, uh, we were having an email conversation. She wrote this. I'm thinking of the three, three facets of awareness, drawing on a Tibetan view, notably open or empty. Second, cognizant, wakeful. And third, unconfined responsiveness, sensitivity, warmth, the capacity to respond. So in mindfulness, we start becoming more and more insightful into the nature of mind. So she's speaking to three aspects of its nature. And you can explore this in your own practice. And uh, I hope it's okay that I'm just kind of, for me, I, I'm laying some uh, hardcore stuff on you, <laughs> some heavy stuff. This is, this is great stuff. This is core dharma. It's fantastic. Um, so... I want to stay focused on the teaching here about loving, knowing, and growing. Uh, so as Tara continues, when our empty, wakeful awareness engages with form, with things, with thoughts, and so forth, there is spontaneous responsiveness, love, compassion. Um, perhaps it's subtle, like wishing. Perhaps it's active, like donating. I think we were talking about donations. The point is, we can explore and become more aware of different aspects of consciousness in um, a, a deep way. So staying focused, if you will, in the chat on my topic here. I want to drop another quotation in about mindfulness. I love this from Matu Ricard, two quotations from Matu. I'm now talking about sati, talking about mindfulness. We have Matu Ricard. One should learn to let thoughts arise and be freed to go as soon as they arise. This is just pure mindfulness being present. Instead, instead of letting them invade one's mind, in the freshness of the present moment, the past is gone, the future is not born, and if one remains in pure mindfulness and freedom, potentially disturbing thoughts arise and go without leaving a trace. I think that could be relevant to some of the commentary in the chat right now. Uh, as Matthew continues, the state of pure consciousness without content is something that all contemplatives have experienced. Right? So I love his languaging in the freshness, the ever arising freshness of the present moment. The past is gone, the future is not born, and one remains in pure mindfulness and freedom. And potentially disturbing thoughts arise and go. They arise, they go, without leaving a trace that endures. And then I'm going to finish a very deep teaching from the Samyutam Nikaya about deep insight and practice with mindfulness. Not impassioned with forms, seeing a form with mindfulness firm, dispassioned in mind, one knows and doesn't remain fastened there. In mindfulness, there's this inherent freedom. We're simply mindful. It's like Matu said, 
disturbances arise, we, we had to get upset about something. You know, there's a place for what's called guarding the sense doors. You know, if we don't like certain, you know, kinds of news, we can choose not to pay attention to it. If we, uh, if certain things people say bother us, we can, you know, shift our awareness elsewhere. You know, there's a place for that. But once it, it's present in your mind, what's our relationship to it? And mindfulness gives us that kind of inner freedom, that kind of inner freedom. We're, we don't remain fastened there. While one is seeing a form and even experiencing feeling like liking this and not liking that, it falls away and doesn't accumulate. Thus one fares mindfully. Thus not amassing stress, one is said to be in the presence of unbinding. Unbinding is a term for the unconditioned, the deathless the unborn, the eternal, the unbinding. We're in the process of the unbinding. Wow, through mindfulness. Isn't that profound? I mean, we can be mindful certainly in an everyday sense, you know, just kind of mindful, being mindful. Great, fantastic. And we can also, by extension, rest in a mindfulness that's so exquisite, we're simply in the freshness of the arising moment as it comes and passes away, unbound. Uh, wow. Thank you, Buddha. <laughs> okay, and then I wanna talk here about cultivation, okay? Cultivation. I don't quite understand the question, Sandra, at 17 after, whose is this? I, I think I'm including the quote, the source that was from the Samyutta Nikaya in the, you know, the early Buddhism teachings in the Pali Canon. All right, now I wanna talk about growing. And uh, there's this, I think, big mistake, uh, cultivation, learning, development, healing, growing. It's a forgotten stepchild in a lot of contemplative practice and, and practice centers and teachers. Uh, you know, you'll, you can go to many things as I have and it's wonderful content. It's really helping people have great experiences in the moment. Whoop, and then it's gone. Goodbye. <laughs> Washes through the brain like water through a sieve. Meanwhile, the stresses, the worries, they tend to remain. Yes, over time, a certain amount of mud eventually sticks to the walls, right? But wow, no deliberate focus on cultivation, even almost a, a discomfort with the notion of deliberate development of wholesome qualities. And yet the Dharma is rife with references to deliberate cultivation. Here, I'll bring in two for you. In addition to the ones I've already pointed out, uh, let's see here, the ones I've already pointed out in um, the, um, uh, the, the, the Metta Sutta. Okay. Right here we have um, from the Metta Sutta, with goodwill for the entire cosmos, cultivate a limitless heart. Cultivate. Above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hostility or hate. Also, to avoid all evil, to cultivate good, and to purify one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. I really like this teaching. I, I've, I was so struck by it when I first came across it. And it's right, so much Dharma is right there. Avoid all evil, that's a archaic translation, probably be, you know, avoid things that harm. Avoid all evil, fine, just step away from it, disengage from it, withdraw fuel from it, don't feed it and cultivate the good and purify one's mind along the way. Just those three. If you want three guidelines for practice, it's hard to do better than those, right? And then you may have seen from me many times probably, this quotation, one of my all-time favorites. I use it in many of my slides, many of my presentations including to very secular audiences. I refer to it as a proverb. Think not lightly of good, saying, it will not come to me. 
drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one, gathering it little by little, fills oneself with good. So what are the drops you are turning toward these days? Is rest a drop? Is disen the feeling of disengagement from quarreling? Contentiousness a drop? All right. Uh, deepening the feeling of release from being harsh toward yourself? It's funny, you know, I've been um, a pretty determined practitioner since certainly, you know, 15 to 16, you know, because I was pretty unhappy and I, I became fairly deliberate about it around that time and then off to college and beyond. A long time, I'm still just releasing deliberate subtleties and, and trying to internalize the sense of being good enough already, okay already, all right? It's, we, we practice with it. We keep at it. We keep adding those drops. And we keep trying to receive them to, into ourselves so gradually the water pot is full. What are you seeking to grow in your heart these days? What are you cultivating? Developing self-compassion, you know, drop by drop. Great. And then, oh, this is my last quotation, and then perhaps I can respond to questions or comments coming in. As a a factor of cultivation is a factor of learning that's neurologically grounded. I've mentioned it once before. F find the pleasure in what you are growing. Even if what you are growing is healthy remorse or a commitment to sobriety, um, what's the pleasure in it? What's enjoyable for you about it? If only the, the sense of um, peace that comes from knowing that today you walked a higher road. All right. Um, As the Dhammapada puts it, the doer of good rejoices here and hereafter. One rejoices in both the worlds, here and hereafter, in a frame, cosmologically in early Buddhism, of rebirth into different realms. Uh, one rejoices and exults, recollecting one's own pure deeds. It's really remarkable to look at that and to feel the tone in it, including in the um, context um, that, uh, uh, you know, the frame on Buddhism a lot is don't glorify the self, right? You know, I had that back and forth with Jed about it. There's a place for that. In all that, um, there's a capacity to recognize that we are each unique persons, person processes, body and mind entwined, unfolding as an eddy in the streaming of reality. Eventually it will disperse. The person process, maybe some tendencies <laughs> will continue on and coalesce in the, the next life. Uh, as Chogam Trungpa put it, I think your bad habits, but anyway, hopefully some good habits as well. Uh, you know, we can appreciate that and exult in that, right? You can appreciate it. Okay, so loving, knowing, growing, three legged stool of practice. We can always practice. If only the practice of writing out the worst moment of the worst day of your life. You can practice with that. Okay. So thank you for the kind comments coming through the chat. Uh, I may not be able to respond to everyone, but I will always read everything that's come through. Uh, let me see if there are any questions um, that have come through. Uh, great. I appreciate, Charlie, you putting in the quote from um, Larry Yang. And... Um, Let's see here. I love the notion of love beings yet to be born. There's a lot of stuff these days about what's called rational altruism that takes into account if you are trying to relieve suffering, well, what about the suffering of unborn beings out seven generations and even beyond? Uh, obviously, that's an important thing to take into account when we contemplate you know, the growing accumulation of greenhouse gases that are driving us to climate catastrophe. Um, so, great. Um, let's see, let's see. Quick point, someone chatted me privately. I'll just say this. Uh, with regard to parents or family members of loved ones with a you know, significant mental illness like bipolar disorder or an addiction or different kinds of 
personality tendencies that are clearly not good for them, what can we do? Uh, I'm not aware of specific resources for um, uh, uh, mood disorders, uh, bipolar and, and depression for adult or adult children. So I, I can't speak to that. I know there are resources out there in the world. Uh, one of the things that I've really come to, you know, with people in my own extended systems, uh, is to make a choice in which we do name certain things. We do, if we do. Um, I think of four levels of parental authority, and you could apply this model in my, of course, no surprise, four-step kind of way, uh, to how we deal with family members and their issues. You know, one level one is we notice and don't comment. We don't do anything. We just are aware of it. We know it. Maybe we talk about it with our partner, with others, our co-parent, friend, a counselor, a lawyer. We're trying to get advice, a doctor, but we don't. We don't get into it with the person. We have, we notice it, but we don't act on that. Second, is that we notice it and we simply uh, report it. You know, the kid. Oh, I, I noticed that uh, you're still playing video games at. 10 o'clock tonight, and, and I know that uh, you have a geometry test tomorrow morning. Um, hmm. <laughs> and then you walk out of the room. <laughs> you just say it. So then you have, you know, a, let's say a loved one who's your, your kid who's got a significant mental illness, and you might just say, oh, I noticed that uh, you haven't been taking your medication lately. Leave it at that. Third level you notice it, and you move into persuasion. <clears throat> you say, look, I really want to try to tell you why I think you ought to take your medication. I know it's got some side effects, but on balance, I think the those costs are less than the great benefits to you of staying out of a manic episode. And with the crash that inevitably follows into depression, it's your choice, it's your life, you're an adult. It's be between you and your doctor, but I just want to tell you as someone who loves you immensely that this is what I think, whatever. You move into persuasion, hopefully skillfully. Uh, and you know what you're doing, and you're willing to pay the price for persuasion because you feel you have a duty to them. And then the ultimate level is insistence, where you say things like, you know, I love you dearly, but you just can't live with us anymore. When you're, you know, having these manic episodes, it can get delusional, violent, paranoid, scary. Uh, I'm sorry, you draw a line. Or you say things to the people like, you know, um, I'm just not going to talk to you when I can tell you've been drinking. Uh, and I'm, I, and by drinking, I really mean you're drunk. Uh, you know, you, you insist. Or if you have authority, you basically say, no, I'm not going to let you use my car because I don't trust you not to drink at that party. And I'm going to insist on that. So, you know, you have to decide where you want to be on that range. Uh, so I think there's a place for that. And then apart from that, um, can we just simply rest in love? You know, can we huh, and also have the equanimity uh, to be at peace? One of the kinds of wise effort I'm definitely going to explore is, is summarized in the lines from T.S. Eliot. You've probably heard me say, teach us to care and not to care that intersection of compassion and equanimity applied also to areas of our life where maybe we've been caring too much. We've been trying to get blood from that stone. We've been trying to find cheese down that tunnel. We've been trying to send that duck to Eagle School and it's not working. So we try to find a way to be at peace with someone we love while resting in love for them and just kind of resting there. So I think there's a lot of that. Okay. And you could see in what I just said there, the three legs of the stool of practice, right? Mindfulness of our own reactions, mindfulness of the outer world, clear discernment, loving intent, compassionate intent, good-heartedness, and the deliberate cultivation of skills, the cultivation of things in reality, you know, like conversations that have occurred, paper trails maybe that have been developed, talking points that have been uttered and stabilized and then built on, you know, we're cultivating things. And in ourselves, certainly cultivating, um, you know, the, the, the heart that's as big as the world and the equanimity to hold everything in it. 
Okay. So as you, uh, for those of us in America who may relate to Thanksgiving and relatives and pumpkin pie and all the rest of it, uh, may you practice. May you practice. May you return to practice. May you find refuge in practice. Uh, for a long, for many years, I, I took formally seven refuges every day. They're more in the background these days, but anyway, one of them uh, was practice. You could take refuge in practice. I think it's one of the ultimate refuges, practice. So let's just kind of let this sink in for a second. And I invite you to take, you know, some breaths with me here to briefly just touch the sense of loving I'll ring the bell for each of these. The sense of loving. The sense of knowing, of mindfulness, discernment. Another word for mindfulness is presence and growing. <laughs> Healing, developing, learning, cultivating, including cultivating loving and knowing, kindness and mindfulness. <laughs> 